Hey there, Lions. Did you know that you can get access to exclusive bonus audio content by joining our paid support group, the Lions of Liberty Pride? For as little as $5 a month, you can help us grow this program to new heights. Learn more by heading over to lionsofliberty.com slash support. Welcome to Felony Friday, a presentation of the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, John Odermatt. Felons, friends, and freedom lovers, welcome back to Felony Friday, right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Felony Friday, of course, is the show that focuses each and every week on exposing injustice in the broken criminal justice system. And man, oh man, do we have an incredible story of injustice to share with you today. I'm going to get to that story in just a minute and introduce my guest. But before I do that, I want to let you guys know where you can find the show notes for today's show, where you can find links and notes to everything that I'm going to talk about with my guest today, Beth Curtis. You can find that at lionsofliberty.com slash ff 70 That's because this is the 70th episode of Felony Friday. All right, let's get to this interview. My guest today on Felony Friday is Beth Curtis. Beth is the founder of Life for Pot. Life for Pot is an organization that spotlights offenders who have received life sentences without parole for marijuana offenses. Beth started this organization after her younger brother, John Nock, was found guilty of three conspiracy charges and given a sentence of two life terms for a first-time nonviolent marijuana offense. John's experience in the criminal justice system motivated Beth to start this organization, and what Life for Pot does is it shares John's short It shares John's story, of course, and also shines a light on a lot of similar stories from individuals who've had similar terrible experiences in the criminal justice system. Beth, welcome to Felony Friday. Oh, well, thank you, John. I'm so happy, happy to be on your program. Well, it's great to have you here on on the show. And Beth, when I first read uh, your brother's story, and I think I first came came across it maybe a year or two ago, um, it's, I mean, it's absolutely heartbreaking to, to read that everything has been through just for a couple simple marijuana offenses, not a criminal past of, of any kind. And, uh, I mean, the unfortunate thing is, there's lots of unfortunate things, but it, it didn't really surprise me because there's a lot of stories like this out there. People don't realize how many people are in prison for life for marijuana offenses, for nonviolent marijuana offenses. And when we were uh, emailing back and forth before this uh, before this show, um, I told you that I had a sort sort of a similar experience. I did have a a family member that spent some time in prison for a nonviolent marijuana offense, not a life sentence, nothing close to that. So I can't relate on that level, but I can relate a little bit. And I know I know it does happen, and it does happen um, way. I mean, it shouldn't happen at all. So even one time is is, is far too often. But before we get started talking about your brother's offense and talking about your organization, Life for Pot. I just kind of wanted to get an idea of before your brother was arrested, uh, what kind of what kind of view did you have of the war on drugs and of uh, people being arrested for for marijuana in general? Did you have any any view on it going into that? Um, you know, I told you before, I'm 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 pretty old, and because John is my youngest brother, and he's 69, so I. Um, I grew up in the 50s, and uh, I was in graduate school at Ohio State during the um, um, Vietnam War, and my husband was also in a professional school. After that, ha- after we were there, we had uh, – that was a very contentious time in American history, and I was, in general, not opposed to drugs. They were very common. I mean, and marijuana was everywhere. And uh, the war on drugs, I mean, it was illegal, but the war on drugs really didn't get amped up and the sentencing didn't get totally out of control until the mid-90s. But um, I I really had, I I really was not concerned about the marijuana. I didn't think it was a serious offense. And neither did most people of my generation. 
did you had you ever heard of anybody getting a life sentence for for a marijuana conviction? No one did then. No one did. When now and and to be clear, um, there aren't. I'm talking about an, an absolute life sentence without parole. Uh, there aren't that many people that have them who are nonviolent marijuana offenders. But there's an interesting uh, commonality to all their all their cases. Almost all of them were charged with conspiracy, which is a charge that does not require definitive evidence, and they almost all went to trial. And if you go to trial in the United, and when mandatory minimums that were really put on steroids in the crime bill in, uh, in the 90s, um, that's pretty much when these egregious sentences really started appearing. Most, most people, when they're threatened with a life sentence for marijuana, agree to become cooperating witnesses or just about do anything they can possibly do to um, have charges reduced. So those who go to trial, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty ill-considered decision. My brother's case was a, was a marijuana conspiracy from the 70s and 80s on the West Coast. And there were hundreds of people who were involved in it. And it was, it was international. It was um, into Canada and Europe. My, brother's, my brother lived in uh, Europe and, and um, Canada for a, a, a large part of that time. And he had withdrawn from the conspiracy. And at that time, it was it was like the people in the cons- it, it was a it was not a violent uh, time for marijuana importations, at least on the west coast and and Canada, and and Europe really. When he was charged, he'd been out of the conspiracy and hadn't been working and um, doing any anything like that since the late eighties, but. If you're charged with conspiracy, you are guilty of everything everyone did who you knew. It doesn't matter if you participated or if you even knew about what was being done. So my brother was the very last person in in this conspiracy, and he chose to go to trial. So he was charged with everything that that literally hundreds of people had participated in over a long period of time. So if if I remember your brother's story correctly, when he was in, when he was involved, when he was involved in uh, trafficking marijuana, you said he lived in Europe and he, he lived on the West Coast. That was in like the 80s, 70s, 80s maybe. And then he he moved to Hawaii. When he was in Hawaii, he wasn't he wasn't still active in it, but that is but at that time it, it's when he was arrested and and uh and convicted ultimately. Yes, uh, he was he was living in Hawaii. He he was a uh, he was married. He was married. He he married uh, uh, a girl that he'd been with for since he was in his early twenties, and uh, they had a child. And she was um, accepted to the University of Hawaii to get a PhD in in biology, and they moved to um, Oahu. And he was just taking care of their. Um, Child while she went to to graduate school. That w- and it, somehow the um, you, you know arresting um, drug offenders is kind of a competitive uh, experience for for prosecutors and law enforcement. If there's a big case, they would like to capture venue and bring it to their district in order to try it because. There's, they have the possibility of getting lots of forfeitures. There was a a man who had been, I think, he'd been a law enforcement officer in Florida, and he was uh, a fugitive on a cocaine offense. And he wanted to clear his record. And he had gone to California and, met, and was um, buying a boat from an attorney who had been a friend of my brother's in, in the 60s and 70s. And he decided he thought that they may have had something to do with 
marijuana distribution or importation. So he went to back to Florida and asked his attorney to try and make a plea agreement if he could bring some of those people to Florida and have them talk about a marijuana importation, would his charges be dismissed and would he be able to get part of the forfeiture? And they decided, the prosecutors in Florida decided to do that. So that's how it happened. He convinced two people from San Francisco Bay Area to go to Florida and talk to a DEA agent and a police officer who were posing as marijuana importers to talk to them about getting an offload crew for a marijuana shipment. These two people had no idea how to get an offload crew for for a big shipment of marijuana. But the very fact that they talked to them about it made it possible for Florida to indict them and arrest them, threaten them with a life sentence, and then get them to talk about other people they'd known over the past 20 years and their involvement, and that was how my brother was indicted. This was a big case. It was a uh, my brother was a co-conspirator of a French uh, with a French American citizen by the name of Claude de Bock, and it was the case that um, uh, F. Lee Bailey was disbarred over. Was he your brother's lawyer then? Or? Oh no! Oh no! He was he was indicted as my brother's co-conspirator. Claude de Bock was. Um, I'm, I'm talking about the lawyer who Claude, was disbarred. Oh, the was, yeah, uh, Claude's wife was in. Los Angeles, and she um, got Robert Shapiro to represent him, but they took him to Florida because they had captured venue. So Robert Shapiro, who was a friend of F. Lee Bailey at the time, um, contacted F. Lee Bailey, who lived in Florida, and asked him to be his co-counsel. And uh, that's how it happened. My brother was not my brother was uh, indicted with Claude, but my brother was not arrested until um, 1996 when he was picked up on a U.S. War- on a United States warrant in in France. You know, it's it's uh, conspiracy charges are, are just are just terrible, and you know, uh, Amy Pova, uh, you, you've uh, talked yes. to her before. Yeah, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Amy her found and- my site years ago, and, and um, she. Uh, contacted me and did the did the movie 420 and used the people from my site in the movie. We've been friends ever since, and she's she's done a lot of things to help. Yeah, because she she was in a uh, obviously in sort of a similar situation where she was charged with conspiracy and she faced all of the all of the crimes, all of the the drugs that were that were sold through her ex husband husband at the times. Um, I think it was ecstasy that that he was selling. Um, so yeah, c- conspiracy charges are are complete complete farce. Uh, I'm curious, what what was what was the reasoning, or wh- why did your brother obviously he probably chose to fight the charges because he thought he could win, but did did he th- think he had a better chance? I I, I I guess he thought he had a better chance of winning than ultimately accepting the plea deal. He he wanted to escape serving any time rather than admitting to something and, and taking and taking the plea bargain. So what, what was his thought process for not taking the plea bargain? It's a very hard thing for people who pretty much uh, have uh, – it's a very hard thing. For, you know, Amy could have gone free if she had just taken the plea bargain and testified against right. other people that she knew. Instead, she got a 20-year 20, like 20 sentence because she went to trial. Almost every person who has a life sentence for marijuana was charged with conspiracy and went to trial. My brother went to trial because he was the last person of probably over 100 um, to uh, be arrested and, and, and brought to uh, the jurisdiction. And um, they... They want. Uh, he, I mean, it, he was the end of the case, and he really didn't. I don't think he w- would have testified anyway if he didn't. Even if he wasn't, but um, sometimes uh, the pressure that's put on cooperating witnesses is pretty heavy, and um, sometimes you have to testify to things that are 
not necessarily the way you remembered them. Which is, it's interesting because I have been contacted by almost everybody who testified at my brother's trial against him, saying they were sorry that they had to save themselves, and um, they, many of them would like to help him, but of course, they can't. I, I was also even contacted by two agents who um, wanted to tell me how sorry they were that it that he'd been charged that way. So it, it's, not a, it's not a fun thing for people who have some empathy and understanding about human nature. John's um, case was very old, and, uh, but they, they brought it up to, like, 1996. They said he'd participated in the conspiracy up till that time, which was not possible, but that's what happened. Just to clarify, I'm not saying that. I think it's very admirable that that he that he did fight it, that he didn't uh, accept any sort of plea deal, and also, you know, I greatly admire Amy Pova for for what she did as well. And a- Amy, of course, I mentioned to my listeners that she was a previous guest on this show, and I will link to that podcast in the show notes for for this as well. So for 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 your brother's trial. What what sort of legal counsel did he have? Did did he hire an attorney? Did he have a public defender? My brother had a very good attorney um, because uh, it was paid for. I don't know how, because as soon as they charge you, they put a forfeiture on all your funds, so you don't really have anything to pay for an attorney with. My brother's attorney was Michael Kennedy out of New York. He was an old counterculture um, attorney. He was... Uh, Defended the, the Chicago Eight, or as it turned out, Seven, and uh, a lot of a lot of people who were involved in uh, counterculture activities during the Vietnam War. And he um, he was the attorney for Tom Fakad, who started High Times. So when Tom died in the seventies, Michael owned High Times, and he and he, he moved to New York, and he was a very good criminal defense attorney. It's pretty hard to to defend uh, a client when they the prosecutors are trying to indict. They indict the attorneys as being part of the conspiracy because if they take a fee, kind of cripples your ability to defend your client at trial because you're also in legal jeopardy yourself, and that happened with Michael. Right, and the jury is seeing all of these, uh, you know, quote unquote, co-conspirators come forward and testify, testify against your brother. Um, they don't know the the background of how they were coerced into into the, into that testimony and and all the stuff that went into it. And I, yeah, I I mean I, I can imagine that you can kind of picture how how something like that were to play out. No, they don't know, and the other thing they don't know is they are not told what the sentence will be. So that makes a huge difference because I'm sure many juries would not convict someone if they thought that they were going to be in prison for life for a nonviolent marijuana offense. And my brother was a first-time offender. At his sentencing hearing, the judge said there were no victims and there weren't. So that's what happened. And after that happened, um, we waited. I waited till his appeals were completed. And in, in a big case like that, it takes years because they they don't produce the things you need in order to do, go to the next step of each appeal. And so his appeals were not completed until 2009. But in 2007 and 8, I started looking for just I couldn't believe that he had received that sentence, and I was started looking for other marijuana only nonviolent offenders with life sentences and there really are not a lot but there but there really shouldn't be any um, there are some states that have now I, I started out looking for federal prisoners some states have uh, life sentences for marijuana and I think it's Louisiana Texas Florida I think and uh Oklahoma and Missouri did, but they um, 
I, I believe they just passed a law that made it impossible for a nonviolent marijuana offender to receive a life sentence. They had a very famous uh, guy who I have pictures of him on my site and, and with me. His name was Jeff M- M- Mazansky, who uh, was a, had life in the sentence in Missouri for marijuana, and he finally, after 20-some years, received a pardon from uh, Governor Nixon maybe three or four years ago. And he's, he does a lot of... He, he'll do media and things like that because he's a very compassionate person. Okay, well, maybe I'll have to reach out to him and get his, get his story and input. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, so you're uh, talking about these other... Um, other people who have had life sentences for marijuana at the state and at the federal level. Um, and maybe you don't know an exact number, but out of you know how many that you've covered on your site, how many have you seen be granted uh, clemency or have their sentence comm- uh, commuted? That was, the, that was a, another interesting thing with the clemency project. Um, <clears throat> Obama, um, Eric Holder said there may be up to 10,000 um, commutations for nonviolent drug offenders was, you know, uh, for for the clemency project that was initiated in 2014. Everybody who was a nonviolent drug offender had <clears throat> tried to get the sub- petition submitted. It was very difficult, and and we worked our tails off trying to help them because when you're in prison, if you don't have a good support system outside. There are lots of things that are difficult to do, and getting together legal papers, et cetera, is one of them. So at the end of the clemency 2014, 1,715 nonviolent drug offenders and others, they weren't all nonviolent drug offenders, uh, had their sentences commuted. Out of that number, 39 were for marijuana offenses. And they were all, 11 of the 39 were lifers, and more than half of those did not get a commutation as such, like they weren't just released from prison. They were given a sentence reduction from life to 30 years. So for these old guys who were the old pot smugglers, that's really not, that's, that's really a, uh, a race because they're runway short for freedom and I thought that at the beginning of of Clemency Project 2014, I was sure that nonviolent marijuana offenders would be a shoe in You know, it just seemed like that would be who they commute. These people are not in any way a danger to anyone. But that wasn't what happened. So We're going to take a quick commercial break to hear from our sponsors. Hey guys, this is Roger Paxton, and if you're fed up with the government running every single aspect of your life, but you're not listening to the Lava Flow podcast yet, then what's wrong with you? Check us out at thelavaflow.com, or just go back to sucking up to the government. The Lava Flow podcast, striking the root every single episode. This is Chris Spangle, and I am the host of We Are Libertarians, which you can find in iTunes, Google Play, or at wearelibertarians.com. We are a podcast that brings you all of the irreverence that modern politics deserves by examining current events from a libertarian perspective. So please, check us out at wearelibertarians.com. Hey everyone, the Johnny Rocket Launchpad is Liberty. Each week we strive to bring you the best guests in talk radio. The Johnny Rocket Launchpad delivers weekly interviews of noteworthy politicians, experts, and activists. The Johnny Rocket Launchpad is bringing the party to the Libertarian Party and launching ideas in your direction. Check us out at johnnyrocketlaunchpad.com. You can hear me, Kurt Nelson, and the beautiful Heather Nixon talk about the ideas of liberty, rock and roll. It really is unbelievable. I mean, when you look at, at least culturally, across this country, most people, I think more than half at least, have are accepting of at least medical marijuana. It's actually probably higher than that for medical marijuana. Probably about half are, are moving towards being acceptable for recreational uh, marijuana. I can talk to you. Yeah, I can talk to you about that because um, it's it's true. Uh, there are 29 states plus the District of Columbia have legalized it to some degree, 
And um, at least the last poll was 71% of the population is in favor of some degree of legalization. So it's culturally, the, the tide has changed, but from our criminal justice system point of view, it has not. Marijuana is still listed as a Schedule One drug on the Controlled Substance Act, which means it's more dangerous. It's, just, it's there with heroin. Cocaine, meth, crack are all lower-level drugs. They're not considered to be as dangerous as marijuana. That's really totally unreasonable. And, um, and it's, but you know, getting it off the Controlled Substance Act, there are many, many industries and businesses that are lobbying very hard to keep it, uh, to not take it off and regulate it like, like alcohol. Public employees unions and, you know, for uh, law enforcement and corrections officers, etc., are, have a big lobby, and they are working very hard to make sure that everybody knows how dangerous it is. Uh, businesses with vendor contracts for the prisons uh, would lose a lot of money if marijuana were no longer t- treated that way. Pharmaceutical companies and surprising and and lobbyists for alcohol and spirits that industry does not want marijuana legalized. And businesses, um, this is the surprising part is. Businesses and not pro- non for profits for reentry and treatment facilities don't want it to be legalized because they get most of their clients paying clients through having the drug be illegal and then the court will refer them to a treatment program for say ten weeks or three months, however, and uh, they, that's, that's the source of their income. So they're lobbying also very hard not to, not to have it um, taken off the schedule. Yeah, pr- probably because no, nobody would go to uh, – I mean, people don't really traditionally get addicted to marijuana, so you're not going to have many people going to a treatment facility to, to get off of it because it's not a addictive drug. So that's the only way that right. you get people coming in, coming in to be re- rehabilitated from marijuana use is if the court system uh, forces them to go there. That's exactly right. And even now, um, there are, even now with all the legalization to some degree that's gone on, uh, the estimates are, I've seen it as low as 400,000 and as big as 600,000 arrests for marijuana nationally. Now, that's a huge, huge industry. For law enforcement to do the arresting, for the prosecutors to prosecute, for the, for the jails and pr- state prisons and federal prisons that are built, it's, it's, and, and for the reentry, that's a huge, in, it's a huge industry. And if you take, say, 500,000 customers away, that's... Um, that leave a lot of money for infrastructure. <laughs> oh, absolutely, and I just I just had last <clears throat> excuse me just had last week on the show um, episode number sixty nine. I had Officer Dominic Izzo, who is a he's a cop. He's a police officer in the Chicago area. Well, he's actually he was terminated from his job for speaking out. One of the things he was speaking out against was the point system that police were using in his uh, in his uh, office there, where the sheriff was using a point system. That rewarded these little petty marijuana arrests, you know, tracking down, you know, following a kid on the street and shaking them down and arresting them for having a bag of marijuana and awarding more points to that than to, you know, somebody that would actually catch someone for a uh, and arrest someone for a violent crime. So it's things like that that actually channel the police resources in that direction. And a lot of the times has to do with they do that because they get more funding if they get more of those arrests. So it's a it's a truly vicious cycle. Not only that, they get the forfeiture because if you if you do an arrest, you can put a lien on property or take you know and take the property like a car, money, anything, and um, it goes into the coffers and people don't get that money back. Um, they, I mean, they say you you can fight it, but people who were found, you know, even. Not, not not guilty or not charged, it's almost impossible to get that property back. 
after it's been forfeited because we have what's called civil forfeiture, which makes it legal to take people's property that have not been found guilty. And that's another part of our criminal justice system that lots of people do not understand. And it's hard to it's hard to really tell them that's what our criminal justice system is because they don't nobody wants to believe that we aren't the freest country in the world. <laughs> but um, we do have a world of jailers. I mean, we have more. We have twenty five percent of the world's prisoners in the United States, and it's all almost all related to drug crimes. One of the problems with uh, with gaining some some traction to be able to legalize marijuana, to be able to get you know these sentences commuted for people people like your brother, the nonviolent marijuana offenders, not really nonviolent any sort of drug offenders. I, I don't care if it's it's heroin or, or cocaine. If you haven't, I don't either. If you haven't harmed another person, you you shouldn't be in prison. Um, if there is no victim, that there is no crime. But I, the problem is. These laws, you know, people will point to politicians and police officers for enforcing these laws, but a lot of our society, you know, a lot of our neighbors, if you look around to the houses surrounded you, they're in favor of putting people, locking people in cages for for breaking these, you know, these these laws, for committing these nonviolent crimes. So really, it starts with with education, and that's a big reason why I started this podcast. And um, you know, that's it's obviously something that. Um, you're doing with with your website, uh, Pot for Life, helping to educate people. I think that's that's so important. So maybe, maybe you could share just uh, what what what's your goal? What, what's what's your what's your vision for uh, for your organization, uh, Life for Pot? Uh, well, <clears throat> you know, after the clemency clemency project and the end of the Obama administration, we have to pivot to a, to a, another um, narrative. And I have one, and it's, um, there are so many marijuana businesses that are being, um, becoming multi-million dollar businesses that, and that are, are funded by VC Capital. And um, they're under umbrellas for their uh, a structure that makes it possible for many different kinds of businesses to be under the same same umbrella, and it's really uh, kind of amazing to see how it's grown just in the last several months, actually. So I, ha- I do have a new initiative, and it's called Today's Business Plan, Yesterday's Marijuana Conspiracy. And mainly I'm looking at talking about it in terms of the cost um, it looks like uh, the United States spends about $42 billion a year on marijuana prosecute arrests and prosecutions. That is a huge amount of money that could be used for infrastructure, and a $42 billion a year, and there's, it doesn't make us any safer. Um, and the other part is there's something a little bit obscene about having multi-million dollar and possibly quite quickly billion dollar businesses built on a product that people are serving life sentences for. So we need to bring those two things into more uh, compliance with each other. And I don't see how we can not address marijuana being uh, on the Controlled Substance Act schedule and um, continue with legalization statewide because every business that's starting is illegal federally. They could all be arrested and shut down immediately should um, the administration decide to do it. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure Jeff. I'm sure uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions would, would probably like to do that, but. I don't think he. I don't think he has the resources, and there might be a revolution if he tried to do it. So, mm-hmm. I don't think he'd have support, even you know, even from because um, marijuana um, criminalization is a a big government. Uh, it's a it's a big government indus, industry. I mean, it's a it's a big government problem. It's 
if you're interested in a smaller government with more freedom, marijuana criminalization does not fit that narrative. So um, that's where I think we have to go. I don't know how it'll work, <laughs> you know, but uh, it can't be worse than what happened in the last, you know, in the last administration with the with the clemency initiative that really uh, left so many people behind bars. I think that's a good uh, a good catchphrase there, or a good uh, I guess a good mission statement, or you know, kind of just pointing pointing out the obvious that really the government and special interests and BC Capital is now profiting off of what people like your brother are still serving time for. Yes, I have stacks of envelopes. I've been mailing, you know, mailing the new thing to Congress. It says, it says today's business plan, yesterday's marijuana conspiracy, and giving all the facts about the cost of it and how and um, what the challenges are for them to take marijuana off the Controlled Substance Act schedule. Uh, it could be done in two ways. Congress could do it. They could they could take it off legislatively. And um, and have it regulated like alcohol, and then the second part of my uh, this theme is to grant commutate or grant sentencing relief to everybody who served ten years. Um, as far as I'm concerned, they should let them all out, but that's not going to happen. But ten years seems to be seen enough for a nonviolent marijuana offender, and there are plenty of them over there with, who've been there 10 years. Uh, the, the other way it could be done is administratively, without Congress acting at all. Um, the uh, Attorney General, of course, it would have to be with guidance from the administration, uh, can take... Um, they can take marijuana off the Controlled Substance Act, and a president can grant commutations to anybody at any time for anything. He could grant commutations to every offender who's in, who's, who's a nonviolent marijuana offender who's been in for over 10 years, and and it's been done before. Um, there's a there's a very nice precedent when um, Gerald Ford was president. It was the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, Gerald Ford was a was a really a conciliatory person, and he did brave things that didn't that uh, really didn't get him anywhere. But they, I mean, it, it probably lost the election because of that. But they kind of healed the nation. He um, uh, set up a commutations for. Everybody who um, had violated the Selective Service Act during the Vietnam War, and within a very short period of time, he'd granted them to like 14,000 had received them. He took the uh, commutation process out of the Justice Department, which is the only way to do it, because the Justice Department does not want to see people let go in cases that they've overseen, and all these people of the Justice Department made up of the prosecutors who prosecute. So it, it so Gerald Ford moved it to the um, White House and appointed a, a um, clemency board. And the clemency board that he appointed was, it was really unique and you just can hardly believe his genius. These are the people that he appointed to the board in order to give clemency to all those violators of the Selective Service Act. He re- he um, appointed a, a guy by the name of Dr. Ralph Adams, who was an educator and he'd been president of Troy State University. He, had, he also had a law degree. Uh, he appointed a he only appointed 10. James uh, Dugavita or something, he was 28, and he was a teaching aide of minority students at a technical college. Robert Finch was 51. He was well-known, but he was a lawyer and a partner in the firm. And he had been Secretary of Health and Human uh, Health Education and Welfare at that time. Charles Goodell, who was a 48-year-old former senator from New York. 
uh, Reverend Theodore Hesburgh, who was 57, was this president of Notre Dame, and he'd been a, an avid anti-war activist. Vernon Jordan, who was a, obviously a Democrat, he was an African-American, and uh, he was director of the Urban League. So, and, and James Mave, who was part, a director of veteran, paralyzed veterans, and one more person was a woman lawyer with a who uh, taught at George Washington University. That was a, that was such a unique collection of people to make these decisions about commutations for people who violated the Selective Service Act, and um, if he, you know, after after all wars, there had been a a rash of commutations. For, and uh, so I'm sort of poking at that um, because after wars are fought, um, commutations have almost always been granted uh, from the time of, oh gosh, Washington right up through. Um, Gerald Ford, there, we really need to do that in order to have uh, kind of a healing after all this. Uh, this, is, this war has been about as violent as any. Like um, George Washington granted commutations to everybody who was in the Whiskey Rebellion, and Jefferson granted clemency to everybody who violated the Alien Sedition Act. Madison granted commutations to the Lafitte Pirates after the War of 1812. I mean, it, uh, Harding granted a, granted commutations to uh, people who were jailed during World War One after this. Uh, it, they were sedition and espion for esp- violating the sedition and espionage laws. It's a it's a pretty good. Um, track record of granting commutations for categories after a war. And uh, I, I'd really like to see it done, but uh, we have to change our culture a bit. We're very militant and use more metaphors for everything. Yeah, and I mean, I'm assuming the, the war you're talking about is, is the war on drugs, uh, marijuana prohibition, yeah. right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, yeah like, and it's been a war. So yeah, the the first step is to is to end the prohibition, and I 100% agree with you. After you end it, you gotta look to all these people who, I mean, the least you can do is grant commutations. Really, there should be some some reparations for them being victims of this war and being locked away in a cage for for decades. But yeah, that's. Uh, I think they'd all forget about that if they could just get out. Oh, I'm sure that I'm sure they would. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure they would, and that's. Uh, you know, freedom, freedom would be a wonderful thing in and of itself. Um, I think, I think we're uh, unfortunately running out of time here, Beth. And I did just wanna, before I let you go, just wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, address my my listeners and maybe let them know how they can help you out with your efforts uh, with your organization, Life for Pod. If there's anything that that they can do to do to help, or to if there's anything you'll you'll ask of them. Well, I'd love it if they'd all write their congressman and write the, the administration and ask that marijuana be taken off the Controlled Substance Act schedule and be treated like, I mean, regulated like alcohol. And also the second point is to grant commutations or retroactive sentencing relief for all marijuana offenders who have served 10 years in prison. Well, I think, uh, I think I know my listeners pretty well and I think they're going to agree with, agree with all that and, and support you. So hopefully they do, they do reach out. And I think that's really, really one of the, one of the only ways at this point that we're going to affect change. Uh, the, the education is, you know, the culture is changing. Uh, people are becoming educated about how horrifying, the horrifying impact of the war on drugs that it's had on families. Um, it's just it's just been terrible for, for so many people. And I think people are realizing that now, you know, it's time to take action. It's one thing to say, to listen to this podcast and to nod along and agree. You can share this podcast too. That's another great thing. You can you can go to uh, to Beth's website, Life for Pot. You can you can share that with people. I want to encourage everyone to do that. But 
also take action yourself and yeah, call your, call your representatives and, uh, and voice your concern. So thank you for that reminder, Beth. And, uh, thank you so much for coming on this show. Oh, thank you, John. Thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Life in prison for selling marijuana. I mean, it is a completely unbelievable story. And if you're on board with that, if you're on board with locking someone in a cage, with putting someone in jail, with sentencing them to life in prison for selling a plant, then I'll tell you what, you really, your opinion on things are are worthless. And you should not be listened to on anything at all. Because who in their right mind, what kind of sane person would advocate for putting a non-violent marijuana offender in prison for life? It's simply barbaric and it's unacceptable. In today's society, it is unacceptable for for someone to hold that position. In any society, it's unacceptable for someone to hold that position. And, you know, I don't have a lot to add today, guys, after a show like this. I'm short on time. A story like this, this podcast, Beth's story of her brother, John Knox, speaks for itself. I mean, this man's life has been completely destroyed. He had a, a wife at the time when he was arrested, a, a son that has grown up with a, a father that's been locked in prison for this ridiculous, ridiculous crime. All I can ask of you, it's great that you're listening to this podcast. I really appreciate all of you out there listening. I really do. But listening to this is not enough. It's time to take some action. It's time to share this show with your networks. It's time to share stories like this, stories of John of John Knock, of other people who are in prison for selling pot. Go to Beth's website, go to Life for Pot, pick out some stories and share these stories. Email your friends, email your family, send these out on social media. Let people know how ridiculous this is. It is insane that people are spending life in prison for selling marijuana. That's that's incredible. I, I'm, I'm not going to... And I could talk about this until I'm, you know, until I'm completely, uh, completely lose my voice, which I'm, I'm probably about to do. And uh, I'm not going to do that now. So I'm just going to ask you, you share this podcast and we'll leave it at that. And after you do that, after you share this podcast, I do have one more favor to ask. I do want to ask you to uh, bring some more people to listen to the show to help us to spread the ideas of liberty. And there's three ways that you can help us to grow this show. Number one, subscribe to this show on iTunes. When you subscribe, you'll get access to this show, Felony Friday. You also get access to our other two shows we have here on the Lines of Liberty podcast. You will get our Monday show hosted by Mark Clare, where he's always interviewing the brightest minds in the liberty movement. And you'll get Wednesday's show, Electric Liberty Land, hosted by the hilarious Brian McWilliams. So you subscribe to one podcast, the Lines of Liberty podcast, and you get three distinct shows. Now, there aren't too many podcasts out there that are like that. So, eh, you know, I'm just saying. It's a pretty pretty sweet deal we have for you here. So please take advantage of it. And when you're, when you're subscribing on iTunes, please leave us a uh, five-star rating. If you, if you think it's five stars, if you don't, then you know what? Don't even leave a rating. Why don't you just stop listening to the show then if you don't think it's five stars then, huh? Why don't you just go listen to another podcast? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. If you think it's four stars, you can put four stars. But anything less than four stars, three stars, I, I don't know. I don't really want a three-star rating. So maybe you should just go somewhere else, listen to another podcast. But leave us a five-star rating. Give us a, uh, a nice review. We really do appreciate it. It's a great way to help us out with the uh, iTunes algorithms and to get the Lions of Liberty podcast bumped up those ratings. Secondly, Please visit lionsofliberty.store. Purchase some Lions of Liberty gear. Purchase some Lions of Liberty swag. We have t-shirts. We have koozies. You know, they're pretty cheap. They're around 20 bucks for the t-shirts. The koozies are like four bucks, I think. Something like that. So go there. Do that. It's easy. It's simple. And it really helps us out. Helps us to fund this show. And you can become a, uh, a more frequent funder, a more frequent supporter, a monthly supporter by joining our Lions Pride. That is the third way of helping this show. You can join the Lions, Lions Pride for as little as $5 per month. You're going to get access to all of our exclusive content. Sure, you can also join for $10 or $25 per month and you'll get more freebies and things on top of that. At $25 per month, you get a monthly conference call with us. You can help influence the show. $10 per month, you get a free t-shirt, free koozie, um, stuff like that, discount at the Lions of Liberty store. But for that 
low amount, $5 per month, you get all of our exclusive content. And the newest piece we have out, we have coming out, is our Conspiracy Theory Roundtable. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to take part in it, but I've heard about it, and I've heard that it focused almost entirely on the story, the character of Louis Free, former FBI director Louis Free. Um, if you think back to all of the, he was involved in all kinds of things from from Waco to Richard Jewell at the Atlanta Olympic bombing to fingering an innocent man and uh, ruining his life, Waco destroying documents, and then on into the, the whole Penn State scandal where he completely fabricated a report there and of course, you can listen to that if you want to go back and check out uh, the archives of FelonyFriday.com. You can hear my three interviews with John Ziegler. Just um, search John Ziegler on the page. They'll come up. I think they're episode 8, 14, and 31. So check those out. And John Ziegler does a great job discrediting Louis Free, but I've heard I've heard that Rico does an even better job discrediting Louis Free. But in order, to, in order to hear about that, in order to hear about the conspiracy of Louis Free and what this man is really all about, you're going to have to cough up five bucks per month, subscribe to the Lions of Liberty Pride. And you can do that at lionsofliberty.com slash support. Just go to lionsofliberty.com slash support to join the pride. That's all I have for today, guys. I want to thank you so much for listening. This is John Odermatt signing off. Always remember to keep your head up in the fires of liberty burning.